Uh, um, our group tonight is very fortunate uh, to be able to introduce uh, our speaker, Claire Fleming, whose career path ultimately led her to do a master's thesis on our very own Photographic Society of Philadelphia. After starting her career at the American Museum of Natural History, Claire became interested in archival work. And that brought her to do uh, an MS at Pratt Institute. And then after a stint in Philadelphia, maybe Claire will talk about the nice connection between her thesis and, and that time that she spent in Philadelphia at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Um, she later went on to uh, an MA program at University of Rochester and was excited to learn that the George Eastman Museum held the original minutes of our society, of, of the earliest years from our society. So uh, I, as Claire will tell the story, I think uh, a thesis was born um, and uh, she's gonna talk about that tonight. Claire presently works in the New York State Archives in Albany as a reference archivist. And it's our pleasure to welcome her to our Zoom this evening. Please take it away, Claire. Wow, thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me. And um, as I just mentioned earlier, it's such a pleasure to speak to the Photographic Society of Philadelphia because uh, the years 2014, 2015 is when I did this master's thesis. And it was such a privilege to read and handle your original records. And it's thrilling that you, the society is now um, are aware of them and they are held in the public trust at the George Eastman Museum, which means they are available to you to inspect, of course, within their hours of research and what have you. But if you're ever going up to Rochester, please make uh, a point if you can to request these records because you, you would love them. Um, there's nobody on earth to whom these records could mean more <laughs> than to you. So, well, thank you. I will um, share my screen. Here we go. Let's see. Um, okay. I am, hopefully, there we go. Hopefully, do you now see a slideshow? Some, yeah. Okay, great. I have to move a few things around here. So, um, Hold on a second. Adam, maybe you can help me. How do I see? There we go. I want to see you guys and my slides. So is this okay for you, Adam, and the group? Yeah, everyone can kind of configure it to how they yeah. So, yeah. And you can see my slide with the black background. Okay. So this this will be a, a breezy tour through the records and through that, through the history of your society. I could go on and on and on. My thesis is almost 300 pages, but I will not subject you to that. Um, my next uh, slide here shows, shows the link. If you wanted to find my thesis, it's uh, posted at the University of Rochester at this really catchy, really memorable um, URL, hdl.handle.net slash 1802 slash 33134. And there's just uh, a PDF right there. Um, but I'd like to point out the title, newly revealed, obviously, Photographic Society of Philadelphia records, 1862 to 1965, but really it's to 1945 with a couple other pieces in the 60s. And inventory of the Philadelphia Photographic Salon albums, 1898 to 1901, in the Lewis Waltz and Sipley slash American Museum of Photography collection at George Eastman House. Since I've done my thesis, George Eastman rebranded itself as a museum. So you may see the acronym GEM, like GEM, that's George Eastman Museum. But I want you to just be aware if you're not already of the name Lewis Walton Sipley and his American Museum of Photography that he created in Philadelphia. So we'll touch upon that briefly. So just a glimpse of the Richard and Rone Menschel Library up at the George Eastman Museum. Spent a lot of time in there. And trying to advance the slide here. Glitchy.
I'm stuck on the slide. There we go. Okay, caught, caught up to me. Sorry about that. Really jumped ahead. So what I want you to know as well, which is detailed in the thesis, is that there are five owners of the records that are in the George Eastman Museum. First of all, this is what we call the custodial history. Number one, they were created, these records were created and used by your society, 1862 to 1965. Number two, Lewis Walton Sipley bought up every bit of photography he could get his hands on in the 1940s when he created his American Museum of Photography. And somehow, some way, he got his hands on the records of your society. So Lewis Walton Sipley, naturally, because they had to do with photography, he bought them up and put them in his museum, which was right there in Philadelphia. And then um, Mr. Sipley died in 1968, and his wife inherited his massive photography collection, um, including the records of your society. And then Mrs. Sipley, Widow Sipley, sold everything in the American Museum of Photography. And that included the records to your society, which amazingly, as item four shows here, she sold them to the 3M company in Minnesota. That's the 3M um, mining company. It's also, you know, 3M Scotch Tape, 3M. It's a corporation and they had their own museum. So one way or another in 1970, 3M Company decided to buy up Sipley's American Museum of Photography that included the records to your society. And finally, in 1977, 3M donated everything they owned uh, regarding photography to the George Eastman Museum, where they have been ever since. And as I just mentioned a little bit before we began, these records are safe and sound in the George Eastman Museum, but until 2014, 2015, they had not been attacked by an archivist, which is what I am. So when I saw these sitting there, I was so happy that they were untouched and um, I could do some work on them. So uh, just a little quick background. As you guys know, um, photographic clubs were a big thing in the 19th century and uh, they formalized contracts that already existed among friends. That photo there is from the records of your society. Those are your predecessor members in the exhibit that they created in 1888. Um, so uh, uh, Grace, if you look on my source here, you see the name Grace Cyberling. She was my thesis advisor at Rochester and she herself is a photographic art historian. And she wrote that these clubs and societies were based initially on social contracts and built to foster research and formalize communication. They furthered the state of knowledge in their fields and created a sense of solidarity among their members, which I'm sure you guys feel today. So very quick lineup of history of photographic clubs in the 19th century. Look right to the bottom, you guys are there. Um, you're the second photographic society in the US, but you're still extant, which makes you the oldest still existent society um, since 1862. But you can see uh, the list started in 1847. It goes through France, um, goes into England, London, and over here to the States. Um, so I, I quote Mary Panzer quite a bit, and there's the source of her work that I used quite a bit of. She wrote about the Philadelphia naturalistic photography, 1865 to 1906. Um, she wrote that other technological changes, smaller, cheaper cameras and tripods, ready-made paper and pre-mixed chemicals opened the field in the 60s, 1860s, opened the field to new generation of workers who photographed for pleasure rather than scientific or material profit. I'm sorry, that's a little bit more like uh, 1880s, 1870s, 1880s. There's your predecessor members again. Camera clubs were overrun by amateurs seeking instruction and the opportunity to show their work. And you do see that in the minutes. Um, some members are very affectionate toward amateurs. Others think they are diluting the professionalism of a society. And I think it doesn't matter if it's photographic society, explorers club society, the uh, 
some people want to be very exclusive and keep out others, but you do see that the amateurs were a bit um, loved and unloved. So this is an image of Philadelphia at Franklin Square um, in, uh, what do you think, 18, yeah, Civil War era, 1860s. And the reason I have it, and I borrow a nice quote um, uh, from Mary Panzer again, Philadelphia, as we've already discussed before starting, what, it was the place to be. It was the place for art, for medicine, for science, for natural history, engineering, like all roads lead to Philadelphia and still do, it seems, in my life. It's, um, it's definitely, it was a thriving, sophisticated city. So it's not a big surprise that, um, uh, as we see here, and this is a, just a snip from my thesis, um, by the 1860s, amateur photographers no longer needed to have any particular skills or qualifications and their numbers had dram dramatically increased. One report indicated that the number of persons in Philadelphia practicing photography as an amusement had become so large that the idea occurred to Constant Gelou, I don't know if I'm saying that right, a most enthusiastic amateur that a pho photographical society would be acceptable to those interested in making pictures by the action of light and chemicals there in Philadelphia. Mr. Jalou invited those interested Philadelphians to his home for a meeting with the hope that they might form some kind of photography association. His invitation, again, in the minutes, his invitation dated 1860 read, Dear Sir, of course, Dear Sir, the amateur photographers of the city have long felt the want of opportunity for full and free interchange of views relative to their favorite pursuit. Under the conviction that we might readily form an association whose reunions would be agreeable and beneficial, I have made bold to take the initiative step and to ask the favor of your attendance at a preliminary and unceremonious meeting at my laboratory on Tuesday evening, December 4th at half past seven o'clock. So that's the first inkling of the Photographic Society of Philadelphia. Um, so this is, this is your constitution handwritten um, it's in meeting minutes box one, file one of the records at the George Eastman Museum. And they spell out the name of your association shall be the Photographic Society of Phila. Okay, technically Philadelphia. The object of the society is to increase and diffuse the natural, uh, sorry, the knowledge of those natural laws which relate to the action of light and particularly to promote improvements in the art of photography and all men of science, all practical and amateur photographers, and others who are anxious to further the objects of the society shall be deemed eligible for membership. So pretty broad uh, foundational document. It's funny because it, reading on in um, some of the early efforts to form the society, they said, we don't want constitutions. We're not gonna have any bylaws. We're gonna be free and independent. So let's start with a constitution. And that's what you see here. Um, also elsewhere in the minutes, we see that they ponder what will be the name of our society. And they put forth the Photographic Society of Pennsylvania. And then the members were like, yeah, you know what? Let's change that. Let's be the Photographic Society of Philadelphia. So that's kind of cool. Could have been the PSOP of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm just walking you through a few other things we see in the minutes in February, 1863. The source here is written on the bottom of my screen. John C. Brown, who was a member of your society, wrote an early history of your society. And he um, explained what he saw in the minutes of February, 1863. And then I went to the minutes, the real thing of February, 1863. And indeed it's uh, quite a bit about spirit photography. Um, and you can see this image, which is just a random image I pulled, but. Um, we can see that letters were received inviting an expression of the views of the society upon the subject of spiritual photography. Those present, the members present could not be convinced that genuine spirits, many of whom had departed this life years before, would appear to be photographed dressed in the latest fashions of the present time, or that there should be anything but fraud in the ghostly marble busts mounted upon pedestals that appeared in some of the finished pictures. There's also another note that these spirit photographs somehow always cost more than a regular photograph. Um, so we can see in the minutes that the society, your society itself, remained non-committal about ghostly spirit photography, but they were very smart people, well aware of the dark room, so we can be pretty sure they knew what was going on. 
we also see um, politics and real world encroaching into the membership minutes. Um, July 1st, 1863, there was no meeting because um, owing to the invasion of the state by the rebels, only a few members were present so they had to cancel the meeting. Um, we also see that um, September 1965, owing to excessive heat, the meeting was flat out canceled. And you live in Philadelphia. I spent four years there. I can imagine how oppressive the heat of the Philadelphia late summer could have been. So it's very, 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 very um, plain English. There's a lot going on. Um, we see this uh, in 1863, Philadelphia photographer M.A. Root presented a fine copy of his new book, The Camera and the Pencil, for which he was thanked. If there's anyone in your group who's familiar with sort of these early, you know, early books on American photography, this is really quite famous. So it's neat to think that your society, of course, had a library. I don't know if you still do. Do you still have a library, like a clubhouse with a library? So it, it would be neat to see if these books are still there. So they were thrilled and they, they thanked the author. Um, as an archivist, I was extremely happy to see that in 1865, your society appropriated $50 to buy books for the library. But then just three years later, we read in the minutes that that budget was completely slashed. So they had three good years to buy up photographic library books. We see also in 1868, just it seems very, very obscure to us today, but they, the society, your society, allocated $20 to defeat the bromide patent. So I don't know a lot about it, but uh, I do know that it was an effort to, um, well, basically the members wanted more freedom and a patent on bromide would not, uh, not be useful to them in the dark room. That's my understanding. Um, basically, the minutes go on and on and on in a very exciting way that say, basically, Expert X exhibited Technique Y to the members. And here's three examples from the minutes. Mr. Wilson exhibited a number of interesting prints taken by the dry process. Mr. Sargent exhibited a photograph of a bone shattered by ball sent from the Army Hospital at Washington taken by Mr. Bell. And Mr. Tillman exhibited a bottle containing Van Manokhoven's nitrate of silver with copper. So there's a lot of bringing in the expert, sharing with the members, which I imagine you do today, and um, discussion and thanking and so forth. We also see presentations were made in 1870. In the 1870s, a large photograph of the moon was presented by its photographer, Lewis Rutherford of New York. You, you might know him. But all of these materials, all of these gifts and items wound up um, in the AMP, American Museum of Photography. Now this is so cool. I'm sure you guys know Robert Cornelius, um, in eight, famous for making daguerreotype selfies like the one we see here. So in 1878, <clears throat> your membership shared a daguerreotype portrait made by Mr. Robert Cornelius, June 15th, <clears throat> 1840. So the next phrase is that although so many years have elapsed since it was produced, time has not effaced or seriously damaged its condition, which is neat because we know how long daguerreotypes last when they're cared for. But just to point out, this was exactly 38 years after the daguerreotype was made. And even then they were like, wow, it's amazing. The condition is, is phenomenal. So that cracked me up. We also know that the society held and documented events, not just business meetings, but actual outings and events. And um, this is an example. Oh yes, the PSP events were important for maintaining the social fabric of the group. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Their first effort to photograph as a group outdoors and away from the city was a one day outing to Glen Onoco. Onoco? Pennsylvania in June, 1875. <clears throat> and further expeditions, and this is an image, a random image of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. Um, this person, George Wood, wrote up the entire trip for the society's members and described not only the peaceful scenery, but noted who participated, how many glass plates they had taken along, which is 560, 
and how many plates were exposed, which was 430. <clears throat> That's the kind of detail that I find absolutely fascinating. I don't know if minutes like exist like that anymore. Okay, there is a photograph of Lewis Walton Sipley. So I know this is a dense bit of a footnote from my thesis, but just to go through it quickly. In her publication, Philadelphia Naturalistic Photography, 1865-1906, Mary Panzer relayed in expert detail the full story of the Philadelphia photographic salons, including the personalities which drove them, their efforts, intrigues, conspiracies, and the ultimate demise of the movement. This work also includes biographies of certain salon photographers and an accompanying catalog for an exhibition on the salons that Mary Panzer prepared for the Yale University Art Gallery in 1982. Another critical reference is William Innes Homer, who was also a member of your society. So he, in 1984, created another document, another expose about the pictorial photography in Philadelphia. And finally, um, just jumping down a little bit, before Panzer and Homer was Lewis Walton Sipley, curator and director of the American Museum of Photography in Philadelphia. Sipley exhibited a restaging of salon works at his museum in 1941, where he was able to show a number of original works that hung in the original Philadelphia photographic salons. So uh, that's just something I wanna make clear is in 1941, when George, sorry, um, Lewis Walton Sipley created his museum, the very first thing he did was do a restaging of the pictorial photographs that hung in the Philadelphia photographic salons, which were created by your membership. <clears throat> right, not part of your membership. George Davison was British, and this is a photograph of the onion field, as you can see, from 1889. So the reason I'm showing you this is this is a segue into pictorial photography and the Philadelphia photographic salons that were put on by the Philadelphia Society, your society, and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. So just before we get into that, we can see this photograph looks okay. It's nice, it's perfectly fine, but it was rejected for display in 1891 by the Photographic Society of London Salon. So salons were the big thing. You, you submit your work, it's judged, it's juried, it's rejected or it's accepted. So his work, The Onion Field was rejected and that did not go well with him. <clears throat> so he and a number of other photographers created the Brotherhood of the Linked Ring, 1892 to 1910. And they called themselves links. And I've mentioned it because a, about 30 or so links were members of the Photographic Society of Philadelphia. So this is another really important photographic group, the Brotherhood of the Linked Ring, that included members of your society. So they got together as a means of bringing together those who are interested in the development of the highest form of art of which photography is capable. And here we enter into the realm of photography as art versus photography as a technical wonder. And it got really bitter. It's hard to believe, but it was a very bitter fight that is about to unfurl. And I'll show you a few things about it. <clears throat> so the links <clears throat> were committed, oh, sorry. The Photographic Society of London was committed to celebrating the technical side of photography and accepted for show only those photographs of recognizable classic artistic merit in the manner of eternal standards. Whereas the links rejected as art photographs that may have been quote, technically perfect, but pictorially rotten. And that artistry quote, lay in the evocation of mood rather than the statement of facts. Okay. Um, this letter from your member, W.N. Jennings, to, um, oh, I don't know to whom it was. I think it was to the society because it's tipped into their minutes. Um, Jennings went to an exhibit of this new thing called pictorial art, and he did not care for it at all and wrote 
wrote a rather sarcastic blurb that I show here. A settled air of gloom pervaded the whole place. Dense carbonic tones of the pictures, mostly shadows, rimmed by wide stretches of ebony black oak or darkly dyed walnut, all giving relief to the pallid melancholy faces of the spectators, moving in stately dignity around the silent rooms, pausing for a moment to turn a dim eye upon a picture as though it was the cold dead face of a former friend. So clearly Jennings did not care for the, the new fad of pictorialism, which was also nicknamed, um, oh, I'm sure many things, but one was uh, fuzzy types um, because it was a soft focus aesthetic. So um, same guy, Jennings, who I believe is the first to photograph lightning. Does that sound familiar to anybody? I think, and he is from Philadelphia. So he has this wonderful sarcastic joke about how he discovered the method employed to obtain a fuzzy type worth of being hideously framed so as to ensure a place in the select salonic circle. So um, I'll go through this quickly, but the point is, uh, you, you need a gale of wind and an unsteady tripod. You need a dull, blustery morning, the muddiest part of a dreary marsh. By means of fo a focusing glass, obtain sharp definitions in the middle distance. This being done, turn the tripod screw back a few times, rock the lens forward and backward according to the effect desired, and on and on and on. Um, if the title of the piece is to be Fog at Even on the Marshes, it is well to leave the darkroom door open during development. Should the print be a small one, say 14 by two inches, a funereal frame of great expanse will complete this modern work of art. <clears throat> yes, there's William Jennings, very famous work. <clears throat> so he did not care for fuzzy types. This is here to show you a classic fuzzy type by Alfred Stieglitz, who you may know. Big, big proponent of American pictorial photography, and yes, a member of the linked ring. And here's his photograph, mending nets. So um, <clears throat> that's just to give you one example of a pictorial photograph, but they are very definitely dark and brooding, <clears throat> often <clears throat> at evening or marsh or, sorry, evening or sunset or sunrise. <clears throat> this is, a glimpse of what the finding aid I created. So librarians create catalogs to books, archivists create finding aids or guides to a group of records. So what I'm showing you here is an example of the finding aid. So when you go to Rochester or you can just look it up either in my thesis or on Rochester's um, online catalog, you'll see to the left, you see box number and folder number. So, you know, box one, holds the meeting minutes from 1862 to 1878. And there's a little description about it. Box one, folder one. Box one, folder two has some loose items found inside the cover. Box one, folder three, more minutes. Box one, folder. So that's what we do. And I said, there's about nine cubic feet boxes of records of your records up there. So I've gone through and made the definitive guide so that um, they're, easily accessible and you can see what there is in your collection. So, okay, the Philadelphia Photographic Salon, everybody who's listed there, there's 16 names alphabetically arranged. These are 16 photographers who made themselves judges of four photographic salons from the year 1898, 1899, 1900, 1901. These, this is like extremely important in terms of American photography history and your society's history, because your society put forth, put on these, these exhibit, these salons. And each of those 16 people mentioned there, men and women, and number 12, again, Alfred Stieglitz, you just saw his image mending nets. Um, over four years, these 16 people judged and determined whose work was in and whose work was out. And they created this, um, eight of these people created the first salon in 1898. And you can see the purpose is written there to exhibit only those pictures produced by photographs as may give distinct evidence of individual artistic feeling and execution. 
So each salon, and there's four of them, 1898, 99, 1900, 1901, each salon um, somebody, and I'm guessing it was somebody in your crew, your predecessor members, created a scrapbook dedicated to each salon. And the ruler there shows the spine is 21 inches long. So these are huge books. They're a little bit in disrepair. But what I did is um, had the absolute pleasure of doing an item level inventory of every single item that is stuck in that scrapbook is now documented in this finding aid. Here's an example of that album open for research. And there are 55 contemporaneous photographs like you see on the right over there. This is would be turned uh, it's, um, 90 degrees off natural angle. Um, but there are 55 platinum print photographs documenting the exact Philadelphia Photographic Salon as it hung for the public in those four different years, which if you were to study this subject of pictorial photograph photography in, in our country, this would make an amazing roadmap to see how items were framed and hung and you can cross compare them across four years. And some are instantly recognizable like I, I'm not an expert on pictorial photography by any stretch, but I can flip through these and see, oh, there's Stieglitz's Mending Nets, or there's F. Holland Day's The Last Seven Words. And you, you can pick them out. That's how amazing it is, these books. So other items in each and every scrapbook about each salon includes letters and notes about the salon, its stated purpose rules and committee members, all kinds of printed forms and stationery. Of course, lots of clippings about the forthcoming salon, and then clippings about the salon while it was open to the public, blank stationery, um, platinum prints, as I mentioned, and uh, journal articles about the salon from photography journals, many of which still have the covers attached and they're often just quite beautiful. So quick gander through these four salons, which I can't emphasize enough how important they were to the subject um, and the society. Um, here's the first one of 1898. It's these, these catalogs are probably eight by 10 inches. Um, just absolutely beautiful. And there you see some, an example of the works hung in the 1898 salon. If you don't know about platinum prints, they have, they retain an exquisite black, black, black. So you can see that this is obviously a digital image of the original platinum print but it is, those blacks are pitch black. And I was told by Mark Osterman, who is the George Eastman Museum process, photographic process historian. I had him look at these and he said, oh yeah, that was smart of the Photographic Society to document their work in the most enduring possible way, which is to say platinum prints. So that's kind of fun. Um, and uh looking through here i itemized every single newspaper clipping so and fortunately i could see my own typos in there so outside of that just looking at the bottom item that says leaf 43 um one typed letter on salon letterhead in view of the great interest manifested in the photographic salon management have decided to continue the exhibition for a week longer than first intended and and so on and so forth Second salon, another gorgeous cover. This is 1899. And here we see, this is the only one of the four salons where we see the judges gathered around for a photograph of themselves. Um, so 1899, and there is an example of the 1899 salon on the lower. Couple more examples. So you've heard of salon style hanging. Um, this is salon style where everything's kind of more or less jumbled um, up layers and down layers. And I had to laugh at some of these that are actually hung well below. I wonder if they were added later. Like they're actually hidden, they're obscured by the handrail or the guardrail. And here again, we see the same five jurors from 1899, who I will mention. Um, let's see. So 
up here, their their photograph is. Oh, I've got it written. Their names written down, um, but they'll be familiar to you. But in addition to that nice silhouette up top, the five judges sat for a tintype, which is um, again Mark Osterman, process historian at George Eastman Museum. He said. That's really interesting to him because tintypes were about as cheap a piece of photography as you could get. They are literally e exposed and um, created on a piece of tin. And um, he, Mark Osterman said the fact that this group of, you know, very high, highly regarded photographers posed for a tintype actually says they did not take themselves too seriously because tintypes were literally a dime a dozen. So on on this particular page of the Salon album, I described what I saw, which here's the names of the juror, F. Holland Day, Clarence H. White, Gertrude Kaiserbeer, Henry Troth, and F. Benjamin Johnston. And then there's a paper wrapper for the tintype that the group inscribed, quote, to the archives of the Photographic Society of Philadelphia, a token of highest esteem and loyal appreciation from the jury of selection of the Salon of 1899. And it, the photograph includes, I'll show you again. <coughs> this is the inscription on purple. And here's the Applegate tintype um, advertisement, which reads, for tintypes rare, <coughs> For tin types rare at prices low, one minute just to wait. Nine for a nickel now are made only by Applegate. And there is um, that photo of the group in the tin type. I found on JSTOR, somebody at the Smithsonian had a very similar tin type of the same exact group, like probably one of the nine tin types made for a nickel. And they wrote an entire essay about the tin type. It's called Essay on a Tin Type. So that was kind of wild for me to think that we had one of the nine tintypes and they had another. <clears throat> okay, Second Salon had 17,119 attendees in a week. The first salon I, I failed to mention had 15,000 attendees. To me, that seems incredibly high. <clears throat> and here we are the third, just going a little quicker very different look there's only four items in in a space so it's a little bit different look and feel and guess what this is mending nets by alfred stieglitz <clears throat> and you heard the spoof about the great funereal frames around tiny images we could see all of that played out here and they, they're very moody images and actually if you look back this particular album somebody wrote a number for each one and probably made up an index of what they were, but that's not included in the album. So the third salon, they're dropping down to 15,600 attendees. And then this is where things got really contentious because the public hated this exhibit. And I'll show you an example, just if you can see my cursor, I hope you can. Um, one, one of the clippings from the time said, if you would like an answer to the question, when is a photograph not a photograph, visit the exhibition at the Academy of the Fine Arts. Impressionism has run riot in the so-called third Philadelphia photographic salon, underdeveloped nightmares, landscapes that resemble nothing on earth, the weird caricatures of human faces, some opinions that are uncomplimentary, and on and on. So we see the photographic salons came on the scene really excited people, the public wanted it. The second year, 1899, even more exciting. Third year, the public is really starting to reject it. And because of that, we see Alfred Stieglitz and a few other judges say, we're done, we've had enough, we're moving on. You guys can have your cheap amateur hour and we're, we're absolutely done. So they left and by 1901, the salon welcomed a much broader type of, of um, exhibitry and there were had 15,000 attendees. So this is just a quick tabulation of the four salons, um, how many exhibitors or artists were shown for total of four years, we had 401 exhibitors, 352 works 
were shown having bypassed the, ju the jury and 1094 were shown. So the percentage of work shown and not juried was over 32%. And this is just a glimpse. So you can remember those 16 names I mentioned, these are all jurors mapped out against what year they were um, a juror. So if they're in a square, that's the year they judged. So Chase, Mr. Chase judged in 1898, but he did not show any. Um, Mr. Cook judged in 1901 and he showed four of his own. So he naturally, it's a way to see like how many of their own works they allowed in the, sh in the exhibit bypassing the jury totally. And they were the jury. But I will point out, jumping down, Alfred Stieglitz again, three years in a row, he, he submitted 10 images. Two of those years, he was a juror. And then here you can see how they all dropped out that last year because they were sick of it. So it's just an interesting way to interpret how these characters were acting with their photographs and the exhibits. Each of those beautiful brochures um, for the salons had a list of, ad, I mean, had advertisers throughout. So I compiled the advertisers into an appendix. <clears throat> I've got a lot of appendices in this thesis, but I thought this was kind of interesting to see who was advertising in what year. And interestingly, in the photographic salon scrapbooks, the 21 inch things, no advertisements were tipped in. They were completely not part of it. And I think it's because even though these advertisements look fascinating to us today, they were, uh, you know, really gauche to have to have sponsors and advertisers in your art artwork. Here's an example of one of my appendices is just a list of every single item that was shown in all four exhibits. And you really can see the names are like early morn, early morning news, early morning, New York Bay, early morning, November, early winter, ebb tide at Wildwood, ebb tide, ebony. It's just, they get to be quite similar after a while. Um, and this is just a, a discussion from the 1930 Principles of Photographic Pictorialism. I won't read to you, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I will say to skip all of the, the work of developing and creating, to skip all of this is to miss the rarest pleasure of life, that of creating something which shall win admiration and praise from cultured minds. <clears throat> So here's an example of one of those um, clippings about the salon of 1900. And you can see <clears throat> photographers stirred by the item, that's the name of the, uh, the journal, photographers newspaper. So photographers stirred by the items expose are planning a boycott of future exhibitions under the auspices of the academy. And the new school of photography is denounced. So not very popular and men who make real photographs endorse the items criticism of the Academy of Fine Arts nightmares. Okay, um, at this point, I will say thank you. I had three, th three thesis advisors, Grace Cyberling, Virginia Dodier, and Mark Osterman. And this librarian gave me unfettered access to work on the materials. Uh, I think she's still there. So if you, if you do go to um, Rochester, sorry, George Eastman Museum, Deb Moore, lady to know. A collective debt of gratitude to Lewis Walton Sipley. And I love, this was his logo, the American Museum of Photography, Philadelphia. And you, I hope you can make out, it's, it's a man behind the bellows of camera, kind of awkward and clumsy, but I absolutely love that. And then thank you for allowing me to speak to you tonight. So thank you, Michael and president and everybody. And then at this point, I just had a few images to show you what <clears throat> your records look like. This is when I first started. I just spread everything out such as, I mean, this is a glimpse of everything. And here's a, a box, that's a cubic foot box holding three enormous volumes of your minutes. And this is just a before and after. So this is how the records were perfectly fine, safe and sound in a box but um, now they're each individually wrapped in acid-free containers, they're labeled. So, you know, before, if you wanted the minutes that are on the bottom of the pile, you have to haul them all out and look for what you're wanting, what you want. Now they're all on their spines. 
and you can just find what you're looking for. Um, this is the only photo I have I took of Mark Osterman, the process historian. He was reading a draft of something I wrote and double checking the name Van Monhaknen, if you remember me stumbling through that, Van Monhaknen. But what I like about this photo is Mark's hand is, is it looks like it's covered in, in ink splotches, but they're actually silver stains because he's always in the dark room working with real silver and real emulsion. So I like that. <clears throat> and uh, that's that's where I'm going to end. And hopefully there's some Q and A, and maybe you learned a thing or two. So I'll stop sharing. Westerns. Anyone bored to tears? <laughs> uh, far from it. it it's oh. amazing. It's just absolutely amazing to know how we started and why we started and that we still have after all of these years i hope we still have the same philosophy that the original members who started the photographic society their, their philosophy was just to write with light to share photographic information um and i i just think your your talk really just brought it so close to my personal heart. Um, and I cannot begin to thank you for all the work that you did. Oh my gosh, thank you, that's sweet. And I hope you'll download the, uh, the thesis and read a little bit more. And, and most importantly, the references. And I, I refer to other scholars. I mean, I refer to scholars. So it's really rich in terms of bibliography, but thank you. And as far as the thesis, could you make sure you get Eileen or somebody the link so that we, you know, we, because none oh, of us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you didn't remember the link I said? It's in the oh. beginning. She, she, she showed it in the beginning. No, but if you could just send it and then. Oh, yes, I will. I will send it. Okay, absolutely. No, I appreciate that. And, you know, it's funny because I can see how many times it's been downloaded. So it's, it's about 85 right now. Easily 10 or 15 are my own. <laughs> so I'd love to see somebody else <laughs> but that's so sweet thank you the other thing that was really impressive were how many people attended exhibits in one week <laughs> wow right Woo. We, 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 no, I did have a question on start working harder <laughs> claire i did have a question on a salon style like exhibiting where the pictures are all very close together versus a commercial gallery where everything is very far apart I have a question. How does that work? How does it work in terms of hanging? Yeah, like we, you said, salons are everything is close together versus yeah. a gallery, everything is far apart. Yeah, I, I just know that it's a fad. It was a fashion. Maybe somebody else here could answer, but it, you see salon style, um, definitely 18th and 19th century images of, of palaces and libraries. There's not a space on the wall that's not covered with something hanging and if they get if the ceiling's really high then they tip they tip the paintings or the photographs so salon style is my understanding is it's it is i say jumbled but uh, very closely spaced and up and low and down and all over so it'd be interesting to know why and when that changed and i don't know Claire, if i may say that is an awesome body of work i mean that's just phenomenal in my opinion and I have a question, and that is, how did you get started on that? What attracted you to the whole subject and led you to really take the initiative to go through all that and find all that information wow. about photography? Well, thank you. First of all, no one has ever said it's an awesome body of work, so I'm going to float on that for a little okay, while. Okay, well, you have a first here then. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I did decide... As an archivist, I, I had a gap in my resume, as we say, I, I was between jobs and I decided to go get this master's degree at, through the University of Rochester and George Eastman called Photographic Preservation and Collection Management, PPCM. And um, <clears throat> the, you know, you just spend time in their archives and I, I, we were challenged to write a certain paper my first semester there. And I found reference to the 1888 exhibit, just a little exhibit by your society. And I thought, wow, I worked in Philadelphia. I love Philadelphia. It's 
you know, gets in you, right? And I, I'm in, I spent decades and decades in New York City. And when I finally got a job in Philadelphia, my nonverbal description of Philadelphia was, ah, compared to <laughs> New York. So I just, I love Philadelphia. And this, it was just an entry point into what turned out to be the entire society records up to 1942. So it was just a, a chance poking around, I guess you could say, serendipity. And uh, I wrote a paper on that and thought, I remember thinking to myself, maybe even my paper said, boy, this would make a good thesis for somebody, not me, but somebody. And then the next semester I said, well, yeah, me, well, um, let me get back into those papers. And as I mentioned, the librarian um, just gave, literally said, have at it, you don't need me, which is nice because not all libraries can do that. Sometimes you're one folder at a time. Sometimes we've been handed. So it's a privilege. And I had the time to do item level work. Normally as an archivist, we're like, okay, here's here's a, the quick collection level description. And if I have time, I'll get back to it. But I had the time, I was a master's student. I had nothing else doing. So I was able to go so deep, but thank you. Oh, the, the, the world is better off for it than so is uh, photography. Are, are you a photographer? Amateur. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I used to, I took darkroom classes. I'm, I'm old enough to have been in, in that scene and it was fun and wonderful. Um, I'm not a photographer, but, but I'm fascinated in your history. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Claire, I think it's interesting that um, Hoffa was the center of uh, these salons and uh, today, you don't, you can't study uh, photography at Patha. You cannot? No. Really? No. Why is that? I I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, when when uh, uh, in reading about Patha, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, Fine Arts. In yeah. I I know that after one after these salons were done. The last one was 1900, 1900, 1901. Um, fast forward a couple decades, Walton, Lewis Walton Sipley actually went, he heard that Papa still had some of the photographs from the salon. So he went there, according to what I've read, mm -hmm. and asked around, asked around, like, where are these photographs from the salon of 18, whatever? And they said, oh, you know what? Um, Bob has some in his office, go check down the hall. And there's original salon work by mm -hmm. these people that was just hung in some guy's office. Cause, cause that's, and then he found out other people had been popping the double photographs out to repurpose the frames, those giant frames that we were talking about. So, <clears throat> but Papa, interestingly, I don't, I don't know much about it, um, but that's a very prestigious place. So it's cool oh, that it your society and Papa joined for this. I, I know that they, uh, when they do the alumni show, I know they do show photography, but uh, uh, I, I may be wrong, but to my memory that, uh, that who's from, is Arthur, Arthur, um, are you still on? You went to PAFA, maybe Arthur, he's not here and not on anymore. But uh, to my recollection, they don't, uh, they don't, you can't study photography there anymore. Interesting, yeah. Too bad. Yeah, shame. <laughs> Claire, can I ask you a question, please? please. Uh, uh, that was just so terrific. Thank you very much. Um, I think we all enjoyed that uh, more than more than we uh, you know could have imagined. You no, know Michael, that that's why it's like you're a built-in captive audience. Like it doesn't matter if I did a great job or a terrible job. You guys, you care about the history so much. It's lovely, but please continue. Yeah, so a question would be, you know, when you attack a project, you know, like this, some things must uh, surprise you, right? Uh, what, going through the records, you know, does anything stand out as, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, sort of at the top of the charts uh, there is in terms oh, of where this is what you didn't expect. Well, um, I learned a lot about Alfred Stieglitz and the whole photo secession group. Um, such prima donna, such 
self-importance. Um, I don't really care for that. So he he was like, oh my gosh, he was unbelievable. Um, and so that was a learning curve for me. But also I loved reading, as I said, plain English, just account of what happened. And I loved when the society, your society said, you know what, I think we'll allow the ladies to submit this year. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we'll have some foreigners submit this year. So that that cultural history was, is always fascinating to, to read. Um, I think also, as I mentioned, they go on an outing to photograph the canal and they document how many glass plate negatives did they take? How many did they expose? How many did they reuse even? So it's just this mindset of, of First of all, material is valuable, time is valuable and all of that. So there's a surprise on every other page and also really the brutal critiques in the media of some of the salon showings, you know, the nightmares, not of this earth and, you know, only real men would, you know, it was just fascinating. Good question, but every page was something new. And the custodial history. How did this collection wind up in Minnesota at the 3M Mining Corporation? <laughs> I actually called them when I was doing, trying to iron out the, the history there. I called them and was referred to someone who handles their archives at 3M Mining Company in Minnesota. And they said, we don't know anything about this collection, nothing. And it was massive. It was something like I'm going to exaggerate, but like five 18 wheeler trucks moving this material of Lewis Walton Sipley's material up to 3M. And there seemed to be, at least to the person I spoke to in July of 2015, no corporate memory of that happening. But the Eastman House has detailed records of those truckloads coming down to Rochester. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there any evidence in the uh, minutes or? Uh in the other mm -hmm. material that you studied that uh, Stieglitz made a complete left turn, you might say, and, and went on to attack the photo sessions and became an exponent of the real photography. Oh. Is, is there any evidence in the uh, minutes or writings or history that you studied of that, that's those salons having any impact on his decision to go the other way? Um, no, I not that I saw, but also these records kind of the salon material and Stieglitz by then was gone. You know, he's, he's yeah. like, I'm out of here. You guys in Philadelphia have at it. I'm going to New York. We got bigger fish to fry, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think the records that I was looking at, um, his participation ended when he split. So Maybe we, that's when he made his right turn <laughs> or yeah, left turn, whatever you want. I didn't know that. Uh, there's, you know, the Kodak had that media savvy slogan that you push the button, we do the rest. Yeah. One of the um, pictorialists whose last name was Puyo, P-U-Y-O, Puyo, I don't know how to yeah. say it, but he, I found an anecdote that he said um, with the, the modern brownie cameras and like everybody's taking photographs now, all the snap shooters as they called them, he said, you might as well say, you push the button and have absolutely nothing to do with the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Very derogatory. But yeah, these were heartfelt passions, clearly. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> I hope you'll get a chance to see the records. And um, I was, archivists have a weapon up our sleeve called replevin. It's a legal, um, a legal term to reclaim records. So um, if you want a huge lawsuit, you can try to reclaim the records from Rochester to your own setting, but they're, they're really in good hands where they are. They're really good mm -hmm. and available. Um, but it's a pleasure, pleasure. And thank you for letting me speak to you. I will send the link. I think I sent it to you, Michael, the, the thesis. Good. Thank you. It's, yeah, we yeah we we have the link, and I'm sure uh, our president will be sending that around. Yes, I, that's, that's so sweet. I'll see my numbers jump up by two or three. <laughs> Anything we can do to help. Any, a thank you, really, from the from the bottom of my heart, especially um, as I've put in so much time and energy into just keeping this writing with light idea. Um, 
and and how photography has changed and and a lot of what you were saying about Kodak and the brownies and a lot of people feel the same way now about phones yes and, yes <laughs> and, absolutely and, and and yes and look at all those snapshots yes i would i like to say that as you have photographic grammar which is done by the amateurs on the brownies and on the phones and photographic literature is what photographers do mm, very good oh, i like that That's yes awesome. very good so so we've all had a very 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 enjoyable hour Oh, thank you so uh, much. That has been that has been my goal for the last several years. Is if if you give if you give us one hour once a month, you will learn something, nice. and we definitely have learned a lot tonight. So thank oh, you. thank you. Okay. Thank you, Claire. I deeply appreciate the invite. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.